You are a specialist photographer. One that enjoys traveling to remote places in the world. And you're used to surviving on your own. In fact, you revel in it. Being alone makes you happy. Being alone in the wilderness? Well, that gives you a sense of isolation that gets your blood pumping. Except, your latest assignment is by far ordinary. In fact, your latest assignment opens a chapter of mystery from a book that you wish had never been opened. Welcome, listeners, to your tale in the woods today, titled, I'm a photographer specializing in remote wilderness expeditions. I think this is my last job. By N.M. Writes this story is worth turning off the lights and turning up the sound till all you can hear is my voice and let the feeling of the woods creep in. I don't like people much, never have. My whole life I've gravitated to being alone, outside, in nature, I told my kindergarten teacher I wanted to be an animal tracker. Kind of pictured it as a Steve Irwin thing, back before Steve Irwin was a thing. Anyway, I'm getting off track. I get paid to do it now. All sorts of property owners want to know what type of animals exist out in the middle of nowhere. Usually because they want to build something and want to make sure they're not going to get into trouble for killing a bunch of endangered animals. I'll get dropped off somewhere with all the supplies I can carry trail cameras, sometimes even a small drone. If I'm lucky, I can get paid for a job and also get some photos that I can sell to a nature magazine. It's a pretty good gig, honestly, and it suits me well. This one was weird from the jump, way outside my normal area, and they demanded absolute secrecy. I had to carry a sat phone they provided, that was designed to only connect with them, and no other communications gear. I put that thing through the ringer before I agreed to it, but it was a solid piece of gear. Also had to give them a chance to review all pictures before deciding which ones I can keep. Something about evidence of mineral deposits. Whatever. The pay was five times what I normally got. They were very clear I couldn't even tell anyone who hired me which I guess doesn't matter now. Aspectu Corp. Who knows if that was real? I couldn't find anything when I googled them. But, when you get paid 50% upfront in cash, being able to google a company doesn't matter as much. I worked out my planned route with a lot of input from my client. I'd get flown by a helicopter to a clearing. I'd work my way up a game trail nearby, around a lake, leaving some trail cameras. Then I'd work my way north, along a river, until I reached another clearing where they would drop some additional food for me and take copies of my photos so far. Finally, I'd work my way back south to the original clearing, checking the trail cams along the way, and they would pick me up there. Three weeks with a big check for the rest of the payment at the end. They were big on planning for emergencies too, said if anything happened I should get to the closest of the two clearings and call for help. Whatever happens though, I wasn't to cross a stream to the south of the clearing I'd been dropped in. The stream, for whatever reason, was a boundary that I was not to pass under any circumstances. Whatever, not a huge deal. This company was paying enough to set some weird rules. Travel was a breeze. I got picked up right on schedule. Black car to a private jet to a helicopter pad on the edge of the world. Nothing below me but green as far as the eye could see carved through with rivers and lakes. Nothing man-made. Not a single road I could see anywhere. The pilot looked like an ex-military guy, with a lean build, short haircut and a company polo. It had a little rocker on the sleeve that said, Nick Divinos. I asked him what it meant and he brushed me off. Fine. I don't like small talk either. Getting dropped off here was a sensation I'll never forget. I'm used to being alone in the middle of the woods, but this place unsettled me. I felt like I was being watched 
from the second my feet hit the ground, unseen eyes dotting the dark forest surrounding me. I choked down the unease creeping up my throat and got to work. I'm a professional, and the feeling faded quickly enough. I was alone in the world, the most comfortable place for me to be. No sound but the birds in the trees and the leaves crunching under my feet. Started to make my first hike, up around the lake, dropping three trail cams. Worked my way up and around. The place buzzed with life. I got tons of photos. Slept each night in my tent. Felt great. It was the second night when I realized something was off. I woke up to a start, realizing my fire had gone out. It took me a second to realize what had really woken me. The sense that I wasn't alone. I've honed this over time. It was always good to recognize the feeling when a predator had entered your space to figure out if you were lunch or not. Some lizard brain stuff that evolution gave us and modern life tries every day to dull. I took out my flashlight and peeked out of the tent. I could vaguely see a shape about 20 feet from my tent in the moonlight. I opened the tent and flicked the flashlight on and immediately dropped it from the shock. The flashlight rolled off my foot and I lunged for it, grabbing it and aiming it back at the woods that were now empty. In that moment though, where the light hit it, I knew what I had seen. A man, dressed all in black robes. I paced around my tent scanning the woods, but he was nowhere to be seen. How had someone gotten out here? In the middle of nowhere? No electricity? No roads? Hell, I'd been flown in by a helicopter. Who the hell could sneak up on me and then vanish like this? I didn't see any further sign of my nightmare visitor as I circled back for the trail cams and started up the river. I downloaded the photos I'd gotten with them and flipped through them one night, quickly so I could keep my battery from running down. A lot of deer, some elk, the back end of what might have been a wolf. I paused on one, though. The picture was blurry, but almost looked like a man. At least, the top did. The bottom half looked like an elk. I tried to sharpen the picture, but it didn't work. I decided not to use that camera again in case it was malfunctioning. Still, the picture unsettled me in a way I couldn't quite put a finger on. I picked my way up the river, feeling more uncomfortable the further north I got. The abundant wildlife had faded to nothing. I didn't even see birds here. It seemed like a completely lifeless wilderness, and that scared me. It was the second day when I saw him again. I had rounded a bend and saw him at the far boundary of the woods ahead. He was facing me and seemed to wait until he was sure I had seen him before stepping back into the trees. I managed to snap a quick photo Got it. at a distance before he vanished. The hike north was slow. I took photos to show I was doing something, though I didn't see any sign of life. I still dropped the trail cameras though, just in case. Every night I briefly turn on my computer to look at the blurry photo from the lake, staring at it as if it would make sense. The nights were unsettling. I saw strange lights in the sky that didn't match any meteors or northern lights I had ever seen before. I tried not to look at them after realizing one night that what I thought had been 15 minutes staring into the heavens had taken up three hours of time. Something was staring back. I don't know why I wrote that, but it feels true. My dreams turned dark. I had nightmares for the first time in years where I was running through the woods, chased only by the thunderous sound of hooves that were everywhere and nowhere. The day before my arrival at the second clearing, I decided to try out the drone, to see if I could get any good footage. I sent it up the river, around a bend and brought it back, stowing it so I could look at the footage later. I continued to hike up to my planned resting spot, when I saw them, on a ridge above me, Three men, all dressed in identical black robes. I snapped a photo, and they didn't seem to care. They watched me until I was out of sight. That night, I downloaded the drone footage and watched it 
I was halfway through some beautiful but lifeless footage when I noticed some movement. In the woods was some sort of thing I couldn't make sense of. It had the lower body of an elk, but the torso and head of a man with antlers atop its head. I watched as it gracefully ran from the noise of the drone and then veered deeper into the woods. There is something wrong with this place. I sat watching the video and realized I had to make a decision. I could turn this over to my employer, say I was sick and needed to get out, even if I forfeited the money for the job, or I could take the new supplies and head south, get the cameras I left, and try and figure out what is happening here. Sitting alone in my tent, thinking about the mysterious company that brought me to this place, I realized I had to know more about what was happening. I took the memory card I prepared to hand off with the photos that I had taken so far and moved the photos of anything unusual to my laptop. I left at dawn, hiking to the clearing where I'd be resupplied. Half an hour before my arrival, the helicopter roared past overhead, and when I made it, he was already on the ground. I swapped out batteries and supplies, handing him the memory card to take back. How has it been going? His voice was gruff and unconcerned, his flat effect that of a man who felt he had to make some sort of small talk but wasn't really concerned with whether or not I responded. Fine, N not much in the way of wildlife here. I responded. I hesitated and my voice caught as I decided to push the issue. Does anyone live up here? He raised an eyebrow at the question and stopped what he was doing to look at me. Why do you ask? I tried, perhaps unsuccessfully, to adopt an air of nonchalance. No reason. Thought I saw someone the other day, but it seemed crazy. Sometimes your eyes play tricks on you when you're alone, you know? He considered this for a moment and nodded. Sure. No one is up here. They wouldn't survive the winters. And you won't either if you don't get a move on. He nodded back towards the river, an indication that the conversation was over. I grabbed my gear as he got ready to depart. When I was ready, I turned to him. I'm going to get moving. Don't want to lose the light. He held up the memory card I handed him. Is this everything? Bosses are particular about this stuff. We locked eyes and I nodded. He nodded back. Good. Stay safe out there. Walking south felt different. The feeling of unease in the back of my mind grew into a dread in my throat. I couldn't explain it, but I picked up my pace. Even as I collected the trail cameras, I didn't check the photos. For some reason, I was terrified at what I would see. My sightings of the mysterious black robed men increased. Every time I rounded a bend, there would be one ahead of me. Every time I made the mistake of looking back, there would be one in the distance, watching me. I hiked with my head down, exhausting myself each day before settling in for a night of horrors in my dreams. I saw giant eyes in the woods watching me. I heard buzzing sounds that grew louder until I couldn't think or move. In one dream I was tied to a tree, surrounded by the black-robed individuals, though they just stared at me. They were waiting for something. Still, the nightmares were better than being awake after dark. The night sky blazed with strange lights that I didn't dare do more than glance at. It felt as if I had tumbled off the earth into some alien world, so similar to our own but one where every twig and leaf had been soaked in danger. The night before I was set to leave, I finally looked through the trail cameras. I organized the photos by camera and then started clicking through. The progress was easier than I imagined. There was really no life to photograph along the river. What I did see were the strange creatures I glimpsed from the drone footage. There were a pack, a herd of them, and as I stared at the dates I realized they had grown closer to me as I moved north of the river. They triggered the first camera three days after it was set up. 
but by the time they passed the last camera, they were arriving just hours after me. I paused, listened to the sounds of the night surrounding me, straining for a noise that would indicate I was not alone. But hearing nothing. The nights had grown colder, and the day started to follow suit. I could see my breath as I arrived at the clearing where this journey began. I sat down and picked at my lunch while waiting for the helicopter to arrive. It didn't. As night started to fall, I started to second guess myself. Had I made better time on the return trip? Was I a day ahead of schedule? I checked the date on my computer and camera. Had I misunderstood? I made my camp and decided to wait until the morning. By noon the next day, there was still no sign of the helicopter, and I powered on the satellite phone they had provided. The helicopter pilot answered on the first ring, and I felt a relief so strong I couldn't help break the ice with a joke. You ever had one of those days where you know you've forgotten to do something but can't figure out what? I laughed as I said it. His pause was agonizing. And in that moment, my world crumbled. I'm not coming back out, man. I'm sorry. My mind raced as the words tumbled out in a nervous stream. Stop messing around. When will you be here? His voice sounded forlorn. I'm not. They know you didn't give them all the photos. The file names are numbered, dumbass. Shit. I swore under my breath. They won't let me come back out, but I wanted to be the one to tell you. Anyway, good luck. If I were you, I'd off myself before those things got me. He terminated the call, and my world fell silent. All I could hear was my heartbeat pounding in my ears. I looked back and forth and realized what I had to do. They needed to come get me, and I could make them. I broke camp and headed in the one direction they had told me not to go, due south. I crossed the stream that marked the boundary of where I was told in no uncertain terms not to cross. I pulled on the far side of the stream, as if I expected a team of armed guards to materialize. Nothing happened and I continued south. I picked my way south for two days, trying to ration my food while looking for some sort of clue as to what I should do next. On the second day, I heard the buzzing noise from my nightmares, and it only got stronger the further south I went. The world seemed to vibrate around me, and I began hallucinating as the volume increased. I saw dead friends and family standing in the trees. Once I saw myself, smiling and pointing into the distance. At first I thought the building was a hallucination too. I stepped into a clearing in the middle of nowhere and a squat concrete structure stood before me. I couldn't imagine how it was constructed. There were no roads to speak of and it would have taken years to fly out all those materials needed by helicopter, not to mention the equipment and workers. I stepped into the clearing and walked towards the building. The leaves under my feet gave way to something hard, and I looked down, and I realized I was walking on blackened animal bones. As I got closer to the building, the bones gave way to blackened shells that shattered under my feet. A large metal door stood on the front of the building, with words in a language I didn't recognize. I reached for the door and opened it. Marveling at the lights inside and the warmth from the heat, I stepped and closed the door, surprised again at how the buzzing vibration ceased the second the door closed and locked behind me. The building was four rooms, a bunk room with six beds, a bathroom, a small kitchen, and a large office room with computers and TV screens. The computers were all running some sort of program I couldn't stop. But I took a hot shower for the first time in weeks and washed my clothes in the sink before hanging them to dry. 
I laid in a warm bed for the first time in almost a month <sighs> and drifted off into thankfully dreamless sleep. I awoke and took stock of my situation. There were a few cans of food in the kitchen and it had running water that tasted fine. I heated up some ravioli over the stove while I considered what to do next. The decision was made for me though when I heard the satellite phone ringing from the next room. I picked it up and recognized the voice on the other end of the line as my mysterious client who I hadn't spoke to since before my departure. I thought I was very clear you were not to venture south of that stream. He began in a measured voice. You disobeyed me. I frowned. It's apparently worked, didn't it? I got your attention. You have precisely 30 minutes to pack your items and depart. At that point, I will turn off the electricity to the compound. I would advise you to be on your way before that happens. Disabling the power that protects that place will create a vacuum. And you know that nature abhors them. What should I do then? I spat. You can give up. It will make everything much easier. I don't like loose ends. His voice dripped with ice. 30 minutes, starting now. I don't know why I believed him, but I did. I threw my supplies in my bag and sprinted for the door, moving quickly to put some space between myself and the mysterious building behind me. I was moving through the woods when an ear-splitting scream pierced the woods. I don't know what made it, but it was as inhuman a sound as I ever heard. I looked at my watch. Exactly 30 minutes had passed. I continued south, barely sleeping as I jumped at every noise I heard. Night was no darker than day now. The sky was a kaleidoscope of lights and movement. I woke one morning to an individual in black robes standing in front of my tent. They removed their hood, and I was faced with a rather normal looking woman. Not the frightening cultists I had imagined in my head. Why did you come here? I stared at her, uncomprehending the question. She repeated it slower. Why did you come here? I nodded and stammered out an answer. I it's my job. I thought it was just photographing some wildlife. She nodded. Pack your equipment now. Follow this ridge south. You'll find an old cabin ten miles beyond here. It isn't much, but it's dry. Stay there for two full days. On the morning of the third day, if you're safe, walk due east. You'll come to a river. We'll have left a boat there. Take it south. It will be easy going. There's an encampment three or four days downstream. I nodded but was no less confused. Who are you? She smiled in a sad sort of way. You have to leave now. I'm sorry they did this to you. You are nothing but bait for them. We'll try to throw it off your trail. I scrambled to break camp and move. It was right before dark when I arrived at the cabin. It was as advertised. The winters had been rough in it, but it was dry and removed me from the elements. Yesterday passed without incident, and as the sun started to set today, I let myself get my hopes up for the first time. Maybe I could get out of here. Maybe I would survive this. Dusk had settled across the area when I saw it, standing and staring at the cabin. It must have been ten feet tall with the antlers on its head, but the man-elk creature stood motionless, watching me. I looked around and saw another, then another. They surrounded the cabin. That was hours ago. I've been struggling to type this since. They haven't moved once in that time, but they're waiting for something. I can hear the buzzing from my dreams again. And now, I realize that what I heard coming from that building was not the same sound. It was artificial and synthetic, 
This noise is alive. It feels like it is coming from the earth itself. Something is coming. I took apart the satellite phone the company gave me. I think I've managed to get a weak data connection on here. Might be enough to get this up on a text-only website. Tell people about what happened to me. They've moved now, but they're still here. I can see them in a distance. Odd shadows cast off their antlers. I hear something else too. Something unbelievably huge. It's here now. I can see it. It is... Daddy. I cradle her close to my chest as I lift her little frame from the sofa. It's well past midnight, and I should have done this long ago. It's time to take her to bed. She stirs as I raise her into my arms. Her gentle blue eyes part ever so slowly as she takes in the room and the situation. Hey, honey. Time for bed now, don't worry. Daddy's got you. I bring her in tight so I don't lose my grip on her. I feel her little body relax in my arms as she waffles between awake and sleep. I move tenderly and speak as soft as I can so not to rouse her. As I said, it is well beyond the time to have done this. We've been on that couch watching old movies since six when I got home from work. She really liked the classic Disney movies I love. Robin Hood, Winnie the Pooh, she even shed a little tear during Hercules. I think she liked the same movies as me because these old favorites of mine put me at ease, and therefore put her at ease too. It only makes sense if her dad's relaxed, so is she. I glance to the living room, before ascending the stairs. It's littered with snack wrappers, popcorn, soda cans, juice boxes, beer cans, and some plates with some fish fingers still on them. Half-eaten, tartar sauce glazing over from when I plated it hours ago. She was all ready for our little movie night when I got home, dressed in her little PJs, an oversized t-shirt of mine, and her little polka dot pants that I don't even remember buying. She practically barraged me with requests as soon as I got home from work. It completely caught me off guard. Seeing as she's been so quiet and so dour these last few days. Daddy, can we watch movies tonight? Daddy, can we have fish sticks tonight? Daddy, I want some soda, please. Her energy was so bombastic, I could tell she must have been looking forward to this for some time. After I recovered from that assault of questions, I promised her we'd have a nice night together. I began making my way upstairs, careful not to wake the little girl. We make it to my room and I flick the bedside lamp on, laying her down on my pillows. She asks a murmured question. Daddy, can you tell me a bedtime story? Her sudden words startle me. I'm sorry, honey. Daddy doesn't have any storybooks in the house. I pull up the blankets over her and begin tucking them around her tightly. Please, Daddy, even if it's just made up. I hold her little cheek in my hand, hoping my trembling isn't noticeable. I'm sorry, honey. Daddy has some important grown-up work to do. I can't tonight. I lean in and give her a little kiss on her icy forehead. Just try to get some sleep, baby. Okay. Could you leave the lights on tonight? She rolls over and snuggles into the blankets. Of course, sweetie. I leave the lamp and the little girl and gently close the door. Stealthily, I make my way to the garage. I take some chains and a padlock along with my nail gun. I bolt the door shut. Thankfully, the room has no windows, so I don't have to worry about that. I chain the door to the wall and... Lock it up tight. She can't get out now. I scramble breathlessly into my car. The stove should be filling the house with gas right now. I crank the engine. 
The candle I left at the door will only buy me a few minutes. The car roars out of the driveway, and I'm well down the boulevard before I see it. An orange flash behind me, well into the horizon. I made it. She can't follow me now. Please, don't judge me too harshly. You don't understand. You can't understand. It's been going on for days now. Silently watching from every corner of my vision. This might be the only way to escape. I laugh like a madman. I think I got away. I'm practically raving in my car by the time I get on the highway. Then we pass the first lamppost. I dare not look into the passenger seat. I can see her little figure there. Only now it looks like it did before. Blackened and muddy. My heart is in my throat. My car is roaring down the freeway. Daddy, please don't judge me. Why did you do that? You don't understand. Where are we going? You can't understand. Are we going somewhere fun? I turn the wheel towards the guardrail. I don't have a daughter. I love my job, but I don't understand the mandatory popsicles. For the past month, I've been working at this new place downtown. I sit at a desk all day and enter numbers into an Excel spreadsheet. It is mind-numbing, repetitive, and antisocial. I love it. I have a spacious cubicle, my own computer, and a chair with a lumbar support. Best of all is all the lax working environment. As long as you meet your quota each day, management takes a hand-off approach. However, there is one rule they rigorously enforce. At the beginning of each workday, every employee is required to gather in the boardroom and eat a popsicle. They offer a simple spread of cherry, grape, and mango. For the diabetic staff members, they have a sugar-free alternative. They taste and feel like normal popsicles, but every time I peel back the wrapper and take the first lick, I feel at my core that something is intrinsically wrong about the whole thing. I don't want it to sound as though I don't like popsicles. I think they are fantastic. They taste good, are super refreshing, and take about five minutes to consume. At first, I felt uncomfortable standing in a cramped boardroom with about two dozen other people eating a frozen treat. After a couple of weeks, I got used to it. But I still could not shake the feeling that it was an incredibly eccentric workplace policy to make popsicle eating a mandatory part of the job. The only time I really interacted with my manager was during the daily popsicle meetings. He's always ensured I had my name checked off on the sign-in sheet. He collected our wrappers in an outstretched garbage bag. This has been the routine every single morning since I started until yesterday. I was running late and I missed the popsicle meeting. I was hoping that if I snuck in, I could avoid an awkward interrogation by the manager. I darted out of the elevator as soon as it opened, and I ducked my head down so no one would see me enter. Ahead of me, the office was filled with the chaotic milling of over a dozen unfamiliar men. They all wore red doctor's scrubs and had surgical masks that obscured their faces. I watched bewildered as they walked in and out of my co-workers' cubicles, dragging behind them trays of unfamiliar equipment. I heard them mumble to each other in an Eastern European language I could not understand. I advanced slowly towards my desk, keeping an eye on the intruders. I glanced into the nearby cubicles. I noticed that none of my co-workers seemed to pay these red-clothed men any attention at all. Completely oblivious, they continued tapping away on their keyboards. I arrived at my cubicle and found that one of the strange men awaited me. He was on his knees tinkering with arcane looking tools. Sprouting in front of him was something that resembled a waist high red mushroom. I saw copper piping sticking out of this strange fungus and snake its way into the back of my computer seat. What the hell is that thing? I asked. I saw the man in red suddenly bolt alert. He stopped what he was doing and whispered something into his wrist. 
Five seconds later, my manager leaned into my cubicle. He has a raging grin and holds a wrapped popsicle in his hand. Hey, guy! We missed you this morning. But don't worry, I put one aside for when you came in. He passed it to me and waited expectantly. Thanks, I said, removing the wrapper and placing the frozen tip to my tongue. No problem. He watched me lick the popsicle down to the stick before shooting me a pair of finger guns and retreating back to his office. I turned around to examine the weird mushroom behind me. It was gone, along with the man in the red scrubs. I stood up and scanned the office. All the strangers and all of their curious pieces of equipment had vanished. I sat back down on my computer chair to collect myself. There was no way that all those men could evacuate the office so quickly, especially not with all their tools. I must be going crazy. I loaded up Excel and went to work. I didn't see the men in red scrubs or the odd mushrooms for the rest of the day. Throughout the day, I could not escape the feeling that I'd discovered some forbidden secret. I kept returning to one revelation. All the strangeness disappeared the moment I licked the popsicle. Could there be a connection? Maybe there's some medicinal ingredient in the popsicles that's messing with my brain chemistry. But why would my employer do that? I came up with a few possible explanations. First, maybe the company is drugging us with performance enhancing drugs to improve productivity, sort of like fighter pilots. Since I missed my morning dosage, maybe I was experiencing the symptoms of withdrawal. In that case, the men in red and the giant mushroom were nothing but a visual hallucination. But I never saw anything like that on my popsicle free weekends. So there goes that theory. Another option was that Excel was warping my brain. The men in the red scrubs then would be an expression of neurological damage. The best explanation was that maybe the popsicles prevented me from seeing something. Instead of blocking out pain, they inhibited the brain's ability to process certain images. That would mean that the strangers have always been there, lurking invisibly all around us. I haven't seen them until today. I have been consistent with my morning licks. No matter the explanation, I vowed I would never eat another popsicle. Unfortunately, that put me in a major dilemma. My job depended upon my consumption of the frozen snack. Despite its eccentricities, I really wanted to keep my job. I needed a strategy that I could get past the scrutiny of my manager. So I devised a plan just before the popsicle meeting. I would store an unwrapped condom in my cheek. When the time came to consume the popsicle, I would use the condom to act as a barrier between the frozen treat and my mouth. That way, the poison my employer was supplying would not enter my system. Additionally, I would keep a plastic bag in the collar of my shirt that would allow me to spit out the excess liquid. This morning, I tried out my plan. The manager smiled at me and nodded as I entered the boardroom. I already had the condom in my mouth. I picked up a cherry-flavored popsicle and retreated to my corner. This was the moment of truth. I unwrapped the popsicle, tongued my mouth condom into position, and slowly slid the frozen treat into the rubber sheath. And I started choking uncontrollably. Part of the condom dipped past the back of my throat, triggering my highly sensitive gag reflex. I realized too late that I should have taken this weakness into consideration before enacting this plan. Everyone in the boardroom stared at this spectacle. I coughed so hard, my eyes watered. I gave up and noiselessly regurgitated the condom-wrapped popsicle into my hand. Absolute silence followed. I felt someone behind me breathe heavily into my ear. I knew it was one of the men in the red scrubs. I turned around and no one was there. Moments later, the manager took me into his office. The HR rep followed shortly after. They terminated my employment. Apparently, since I was still in my probationary period, they had no problem releasing me. It seems they got the impression that I have a perverse sense of humor. They said my behavior was unbecoming in a professional environment. 
They said the popsicle meetings were meant to be a cheap and effective way to engender office-wide camaraderie. They emphasized it was not an opportunity for a badly timed fellatio joke. I mentioned the men in red and the tubes in the mushrooms. My manager then said, they aren't really a problem as long as you eat your popsicles. What I Cannot Know It is 1918. Four miles from here, at the front, a fragment of German shell strikes a rock. It ricochets with such force that it cuts entirely through one man's stomach and another man's arm. By then, it has lost enough momentum that when it strikes the third man in the jaw, it lodges there. The first man is dead. The other two will be arriving soon. But when I tell Seamus this, he doesn't believe me. <laughs> you cannot know that, he says. He's right. I cannot know it, and yet I do. When two men are evacuated back to our operating hospital some hours later, one missing an arm, and the other with a shard of metal stuck fast in the bone below his left ear, Seamus doesn't look at me in wonderment. Indeed, it seems, he does not even remember what I told him. Edith, he says, pointing to the man with shrapnel in his jaw. This one. Putting the anesthetic mask over his face is difficult. The metal is in the way. The other soldier mutters to himself across the room, gesturing with what remains of his arm. He is stable but shell-shocked. I hear the words guts and spill, and cannot bear to listen more closely. The man below me on the table isn't able to speak. But he is crying. His sobs are guttural and wet. The bubbles of spittle that escape from between his lips are tinged pink. Don't be afraid. I tell him. My voice is soft as I watch the steady drop, drop, drop of the chloroform onto the mask. I won't let it hurt. His eyes are wet with tears. I see in them everything we all want. To be warm. To be safe. To be home. I count backwards from ten, and he blinks in time with me. Ten, nine, eight. And his eyelids begin to slow. Seven, six, five. And they are out of sync with my count. Four, three, two, one. And they stay closed. I switch the chloroform mask for the other, and Seamus begins to work on him. At the convalescence tent, another man has just been told that he will be sent back to the front tomorrow. It is another thing that I cannot know, but I do. Ida is the nurse on rounds in convalescence, and that is how I know. Because Ida has told me, or rather, she will tell me tonight, through her tears. Take his pistol away! I know I say the words aloud, but Seamus doesn't seem to hear me. It doesn't matter. The words are not meant for him. I don't know for whom they are meant. The man tells Ida he is going for a walk. He thanks her for taking such good care of him. She watches him as she goes. Take his pistol away! Take his pistol away! I am shouting it now, but no one reacts. No one responds. There is no hope for that, I realize. I turn to Seamus instead. You must hold steady. I tell him, no matter what, hold steady. I know he must hear me, for he is nodding his head, but he looks as though he doesn't understand the words I am saying. His eyes are fixed on his work. I hear the scuff of boots just outside the canvas walls of our hospital. The other puddles on the cloth of the mask. I want to run to the man outside to stop him, but I cannot bring myself to move. Hold steady, Seamus. Please hold steady, but it's no use. The report is loud and close, and Seamus starts, and suddenly there is a gout of blood across my chest, and I am only just able to turn my head quick enough to keep it from getting in my eyes. God damn it! Seamus tries to clamp on the severed artery, but the shell fragment has completely bisected it. It is already too late. And I know this even though I shouldn't. 
and the blood slows, and the air drips, until the last. And at least, at least I was able to do that. At least it did not hurt. And outside, Ida is screaming, because she's never seen a man shoot himself, and she did not know. How could she have known that he was going to do it? No one could have known, except I did. I knew, and I could do nothing to stop it. Later, when chaos has abated for a moment, I bring Seamus the strongest cup of tea I can make. He has been crying, but he tries not to let me see. There is blood under his nails, and mine as well. We met here, at this field hospital. What feels like many years ago already. When he is sure no one is looking, Seamus kisses my hand. Doctors should not fraternize with their nurses, and mother and father would hardly approve. But I am long past caring. I let my fingers stay twined with his. Seamus and I do not know each other. Not really. We only know what war has made of us, but someday when this ends, we want to change that. He wants to take me to Blarney, lays us on the grass, gets us in the family way, then leaves us on our ass right away, right away, right away, Salonika. I don't know that song. He wants to take me to Blarney Castle to kiss the stone. Although I don't know what it would do for you. He says, since you already speak so prettily. But we'll never see Blarney. Not together. He'll be gone before the war is over. I don't know that. I can't know that. But he will be. He will go starving for air. His fingertips blue. His face. I don't want to think about that. I squeeze his hands tighter in my own. And he is warm and alive. I do not know that he will die here. I refuse to know it. You haven't heard that song yet? He says, and I realize I have been humming the tune about Salinica. He's right. The women are singing it now in Cork. But I can't know that. I won't know that until after the war is over. When I go there to find his mother, to tell her how brave her son was, to tell her where he is buried. Stop it, Edith. Seamus looks me in the face, and his eyes are dark. Have they always been so? Something much worse is coming. It comes on a stretcher from the front. They carry him into a hospital, and he is death. I see his face, and it is only a skull, grinning with the promise of taking from me everything I love. His bones rattle beneath the cloth of his uniform, and they tell me that the sound is the rails of a cough. He's been gassed, they say, but they are wrong. He's not been gassed. He's sick. Don't bring him in here. Take him over there. Over there. I gesture frantically to the hospital tent, designated for the sick, but they do not see me point. They do not hear my words. It will not matter, anyway. A barrier of cloth and a few hundred meters cannot keep death from us. He will reach the sick tent in due time, and the convalescence ward, and the quarters for the doctors and nurses. He will reach them all in time. But first, he will come for the operation hospital. First, he will come for us. His flesh reforms before my eyes, and he is suddenly only a boy. He heaves for breath, eyes burning with fever. A dusky hue has already spread over his cheeks. He reaches for my hand with his grey fingertips. He coughs, a jet of frothy, milky blood bubbling over his lips and out of his nose. I take his hand. I cannot do otherwise. Even death is afraid of what he brings to us. His right lung is filling with fluid. Lung damage is an effect of chlorine gas, but I know this is not from gas. But there is nothing I can say or do that will change what is about to happen. Seamus wants to drain the plural space to give the boy room to breathe. My hands shake as I administer the chloroform. 
For this I can know, and this I do know, anesthetic will not take if you cannot breathe it in. The boy flickers but refuses to fade fully under. His eyelids flutter but do not close. But Seamus will not wait any longer. He goes in. The skin parts easily and the muscle underneath. I am crying but again, I cannot move. Seamus, please don't. Please, please don't. He won't go under, he can't. The rib comes out slick with blood and the lung underneath is heavy and dark. Under my shaking hands, beneath the mask, the boy groans in delirium and pain. Please, Seamus, I'm begging you. He can still move. He doesn't hear me. He never has. He never will. I cannot know that the boy will buck when the needle goes in, but I do. And the needle goes in and he does. He bucks and he coughs and the great pressure against his lung is released out into the air through the needle. The pus is thin and sanguinous and as it comes down on Seamus like rain, I know death has taken his hand as well. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm sobbing and it seems now that finally Seamus can hear me. He wipes his face with his sleeve, smearing the bloody fluid away from his eyes. I think he knows now that this is not gas. I think he has known all along, but he couldn't just let the boy die. Hold steady, Edith. We haven't lost him yet. And he's right. Despite all of it, the boy survives the surgery, and then he survives a single day more. Seamus survives Six. He clutches my hand and there is blood under his nails. He is sick, but he is only one of many. No one tries to drain their lungs. No one knows what to do. We give them whiskey and water and wrap them in blankets and wait for them to die. Seamus is dying now. He is drowning. His eyes bulge red. His nose has bled for hours. The pillow beneath his head is matted with clots. The skin across his chest and throat crackles with trapped pockets of air leaking from his heavy bloody lungs. His face is swollen and black. He coughs and seizes and his nails dig into my skin again. But I will not pull away. He cannot speak. But he's begging me to help him. There is nothing I can do. When it is finally over, his hand is still in mine, and he is warm but not alive. Edith! 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 And his hand is still in mine, but then it is not his hand. It is a woman's hand. She is alive, and she is a few years younger than I am, and she looks like my sister. Marianne? But she is not my sister, Marianne, because... Marianne died before the war even began, and she is not a few years younger than I am. She is many. The hand she holds in her own is small and wrinkled and old. My hand. No, Grandma Edith. It's me, Susanna. The Scotsman on the radio sings about a far-off place, and I think at first that it must be Salonica, but it is not. It is Italy. There is a photograph on the wall, and I am in it. But I am older. No, I am younger. I am in my wedding dress and I am smiling. And the man next to me in his suit is not Seamus because Seamus did not live long enough for us to go to Blarney. The man is, his name is Robert. He is gentle and kind. And even when I thought I could never love again, I did learn to love him. Robert is gone now. Two, I remember. But he was old and we had lived a good life and it did not hurt. At least, it did not hurt. Did you go somewhere frightening again, Grandma Edith? I am crying. I have been crying. I am shaking. I was afraid, but now it is ceasing. I remember Susanna, too. I remember that I love her. I did, darling. I did. 
The voice cracked with age, but I know it's mine. Do I go there often? She nods and she looks so sad that my heart breaks for her, as hers does for mine. Don't worry, I'm back now, for a little while at least. Don't be sad. It is 1972. I am old, and my mind is going, and the only place it ever seems to go is back to that hell in 1918. I don't want to go there, but I do. And it is just as horrible as it was the first time and every time that I have relived it since then. But just as often, Susanna holds my hands and she brings me back where I belong. I want her to know how much this means to me, how much I love her, but she cannot know. She cannot know unless I tell her. And so I write this, and so I do. It is 1918, four miles from here at the front. A fragment of German shell strikes a rock, and I know this when I cannot know it. I know this just as I know the Spanish influenza is coming, and I know that it will claim Seamus, just as it will claim millions of others. And I will try to change this when I know I cannot change it, and I know I am helpless, and I am afraid. But deep down in my heart, I now know this, too that I will not have to be afraid for long, because Susanna will take my hands and bring me back, and for a time I will be safe and I will be warm. For a time, I will be home. I know this, and I will always know this, even when I cannot. I found this letter in one of my mum's old memory books. My great-grandma Edith wrote it for her. I never got to meet Edith. She passed away before I was born dementia. Mum's not doing so well right now either. Guess it just runs in our family. It'll probably come for me too, when it's time. But fortunately for Mum, she didn't live through the things Edith did. She doesn't have memories like that. The kind that can grab you from 50 years in the past and tear your soul up again and again. I don't either, and I hope I never do. But sometimes, looking at the world nowadays, I feel like we might be headed for times all too similar to what Edith saw. I decided to share this here because that thought scares me. I can tell you that. It scares the hell out of me. And I didn't want to be alone with it anymore. I guess it just serves as a reminder that sometimes the worst and scariest things, the things that leave us truly sleepless, are real. But maybe if we reach out... If you take my hands, and I take yours, we can make it through okay. We can't know, unless we try, right? Well, listeners, I hope you enjoyed these no-sleep tales. What to do when a spectral girl follows you for life? Sage? Exorcism? Maybe use mirrors for misdirection. How would you do it? And talk about having some hardcore popsicle magic to hide those mysterious red mushroom plumbers. And if my boss forced me to consume popsicles at work, well, <laughs> maybe that wouldn't be so bad, actually. <laughs> and what I cannot know. A heart-wrenching story about the past, the hauntings that it brings to one's mind, and the freedoms that love can bring to those trapped in the past. Just brilliant stories. Thank you to all the authors that allowed me to narrate their work. This Friday, folks, I'm going to throw a curveball your way, keeping it a little secret, as it were, regarding the story. And this episode will be dedicated to an Earl Grey Enforcer. So keep an ear out this Friday. If you want to be a supporter of the podcast yourself, visit www.patreon.com forward slash sfgt.com and bam you can donate dollary dues to the podcast every dollar goes right back in to improving the podcast in many many ways whether it's new gear paying authors or eventually starting up another spin-off series i have only you my supporters to thank so thanks mate just for listening and as always till next we meet